it, I'm Dooner. Welcome to the show. And uh, you know what? It's going to be that time of the year. It's going to be that time of year, one of my favorite times where you get a billion emails a day and you can start saying to people, let's just pick this back up in the new year. <laughs> this tree right here, you guys have been doing a great job. Can we get a little bit of a close-up so we can see some of these ornaments the great freight community has contributed to the second annual freight Christmas tree? It looks absolutely stunning, as you see here. Who do we got? Convoy on there. Convoy's going to be on the show today, by the way. They have a massive announcement. I, uh, I think I'd be underselling it if I went into it. They're going to be on pretty soon, so I will be able to, uh, to give you guys that one. Um, we are also talking about a year in review in Freight with T-Source, and uh, we may have Mr. Freight Waves here today. Um, however, he's not here yet. But you know what? I see someone in the green room that I want to talk to because I got my kids a gift. They're not listening, are they? Bring up Bill Driegert really quick right now. Billy, I got my kids an electric drum kit for Christmas, and it just showed up yesterday. It's the Lisi's. It's a little intimidating. I haven't owned an electric drum kit before. Any advice before I give it to them? Uh, just buy good headphones, I would buy, say. So. <laughs> buy good headphones? Yeah. Bill, how are things treating well, you, you man? Want I, the speakers. Yeah, you want them to you know, keep it quiet, I would say. Well, Bill, how are things treating you? I haven't seen you since um, I haven't seen you since uh, F three. Yeah, good, good. Hey, guess uh, we I still play drums too? every uh, every day. I try to get uh, get a good fifteen minutes on the drums every day. Yeah, we're broadcasting right now. Hey, Mr. Craig Fuller's in studio. Hey, guys, backstage. Can we bring Craig a microphone out here? I think they thought you were coming in. Uh, virtual? I, I think they caught oh. you coming in virtually. I, I was supposed to be here. No, you're coming right here. Look, I will move over a little bit. I'll give you plenty of room. Bill, we'll be right back to you. I'm sorry, sir. Here we go. Bill, Bill Drake. Yeah, say hi to Bill. Hey, Bill. I don't think Bill can hear me, so sorry. This is, uh, I guess I screwed it up by not dialing in. Oh, it's all good. This is live TV. <laughs> this is how we do it. I'll just stand right next to you. We can, we can share Dinner the microphone. Weekend. This is a, the holiday season. This right? is the holiday yeah. season. You know, we're not uh, in the COVID era anymore, so we're feeling, uh, we're feeling much better. Now, Craig, so we were talking in Slack uh, earlier about the spread in fuel, and I think that's a really cool topic to get into, but it's been a crazy year, and I think a lot of people were, you can come right on, Frazier. Just bring Craig a mic, everybody. Hey, meet Frazier. Frazier Good Game. Frazier Good Game is one of our production guys here. He does audio for us, which is why he has the microphone. Frazier, should I swap mics? Yeah, you should. Absolutely. Here you go, Craig. Perfect. Look at this. Perfect. Professional television right here. We're doing awesome, guys. Um, so, big year. You know, I think people were hoping for a calmer year after yeah. everything that was crazy. Kick off the new year with Freedom Convoy, trying to open things back up after COVID. First time, like, a trucker protest really gained massive momentum since, like, I don't know, the 70s. Um, we had the war. We had the bloodbath. We had the rate cliff. What's the story of the year? I mean, I, I think it comes down to the market. Like, I, I think you'd, have, you'd be remiss to talk, talk about, about anything, anything but, but the market. market. So, like, like, yes, yes the, the Ukraine, Ukraine war, war is, significant. is significant. I think you have to mention that. Um, you had all the, and it's not just the trucker protests, it's the labor protests. There is yeah. a, or the labor movement, I should say. I mean, you've had, Amazon has now had union, uh, uh, has had union votes. You've seen situations where uh, places like Starbucks and are now being threatened with, with uh, union issues. Uh, I think the labor movement is real. The rail strike that could have come was yes. going to be massively disruptive. You had port issues. All of that stuff, I think, is pretty impactful. So those are the two biggest stories of the year, but I think the backdrop is the economy. Yeah. What I think, is, I think what we're seeing now is inflation, inflation has caused everybody to realize that while they have done well financially in terms of just making more money, they're not... They're not keeping ahead. And I think it, we've just seen a much greater division between the rich and the poor. And this economic cycle is certainly exacerbating that. I mean, just look at trucking. It's the small truckers that are really impacting it. You mentioned fuel prices. Yeah. Um, you know, wholesale rack prices that the big trucking companies buy their fuel on, they're, the, they're able, you know, they've seen a, a collapse in diesel prices over the last couple of months, whereas the retail price has not seen that. No, no, you know, so it's funny you mentioned that. So I went out, I asked the trucking community what their, what it costs them to run, right? What they need per mile to make it happen. I heard answers anywhere from $1.50 to, depending on the mode, like $3.50, but in dry van, it was $1.50 to $2. We have a chart right here, it's our NTDLI, that is dry van rates, line haul only. I went through this thing, the lowest we hit this year in 2022 was 161. My question for you is next year, 
over or under will at any point we go below 130? I mean, 130 is not sustainable long term. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it also depends on what the price of fuel does in terms of how sustainable. I don't think fuel is going to get to the back to, you know, really low levels in terms of being $30 a barrel. I don't think oil will do that. Certainly don't think diesel will drop below $2 a gallon. So that it's unlikely that we would ever go to a dollar 30 for any sustained period. I think you're asking, will it ever hit a buck? Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, that is far below the variable operating cost for most trucking companies, even with fuel really um, dropping as much as it has in the uh, wholesale market, there's no reason to think that that would be above the price, the variable cost that it takes to operate a truck. Now, there's haters out there that you're like Mr. Doom and Gloom, right? Mr. Freight Waves, he's Mr. Doom and Gloom. All he talks about is blood baths like Lady Bathory or something. However, you turned positive recently. You said that you indicated at least that in June... Things may pick, pick up a little bit. You know, it's funny because back in 2020, in the summer of 2020, I was getting, uh, people were attacking me for being overly bullish. Like, <laughs> I was nuts because we were, I, Bloomberg called me the most bullish guy in America when yeah. I was on TV uh, in the month of May or June of, uh, in the summer of 2020, because I was talking about how this is going to be an aggressive recovery in the economy. So, yes, I have been overly bearish, but yeah. I would also say well, you've been overly that, right. that is been <laughs> right. I don't, all of the folks that have sort of disagreed with our view on a freight recession. Now, maybe the, the term bloodbath has been this really polarizing. It's created a lot of sort of, you know, it, it's very dramatic. Yeah. Like the, the term bloodbath is a very dramatic term. I understand where it's a very um, triggering word, and I understand where people can, very, uh, can, can, can gather that. The reality is we've hit a freight recession and yeah. all of the bullish arguments that have existed for the last couple of quarters are just gone. We now see the LTL operators and LTL isn't subject to the supply and demand challenges that the truckload market is because there are significant barriers to entry. If you and I wanted to start an LTL company yeah. and let's say that we're going to do Chattanooga to Boston, this is our lane, um, we would have to go build a, a whole terminal network. We'd have to have a local driver in Chattanooga, a couple of them to bring it back to a terminal, sort freight and then we'd have to do the same thing in Boston as we'd have to build a terminal on that. If we want to do a truckload operator to build, to do the same thing, we would just simply get in a truck. It'd be two men in a truck going yeah. from, we drive team. What would we drive, by the way? What would we drive? I, what do you guys think? Do you think we, I was in a, like the Hylian I was in was a Peterbilt and I really liked it. I like the Mac Anthem. Yeah? Yeah, Mac I mean, Anthem. they're expensive, but I think they're the best looking truck on the road. I think it was a Peterbilt 578 if I'm not wrong, yeah. You, you like yeah. your, your Peterbilt? I, I like the horn on it. Or maybe it was just that they let me use the horn a lot and that got yeah. me into it. So anyways, <laughs> I, it's it's a different market. The LTL market, we've seen that dry up and I think that's the sort of the indication that things are dire, are, 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 are struggling. We've also seen the ocean market. So yes, we have been Dr. Doom and Gloom, you can call it. That is true. And I, yeah. I, I, I think the reality is we, we forewarned what people are now seeing. Yeah. And if people had taken, I, I talked to a, a guy two nights ago uh, who I have known, I hadn't talked to him in a couple of years, but two years ago, he, he went out and started a trucking company, bought 15 trucks. And he was panicked this week. He was texting me, asking me to invest in his business because he's behind. And I said, you need to sell your equipment because Q1 is going to be any worse. And he's, he's underwater. And he said, I, 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 I can't do that. I don't think I can do that. And I, was, I, I thought to myself, you know, if he had taken action this summer to prepare for the quote-unquote winter, he would be in a different position. And I think the goal that we've always had at Freightways is always to be transparent, yeah. to be direct, so that people understand what we're saying. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 and people understand why we believe certain things. And I don't think we've ever wavered from that. It certainly hasn't won any popularity contest. Nobody wants to hear about a recession. No. Like, I don't become a popular person by talking about businesses struggling. But this is the, the reality in the economy. And as we look forward to next year, am I bullish? I think... The reason I'm turning more bullish is because this current market will not stay this way forever. Yeah. Inventories are going to burn off. Inventories are going to replenish. The Federal Reserve is going to start cutting interest rates at some point in the future. And when they do, it's going to be a much healthier market. It may take 6 to 12 months, but 
when we come out of this, we'll have a much stronger economy and a much stronger market. I mean, inflation's been, it's been interesting because grocery store, you get killed if you go there. But if you were out on Black Friday, any electronics you wanted could have been had dirt cheap. Like 3,000 RTVs were slashed to 1,500. $300 headphones were like 150. So, and we saw a little bump in sonar from that. I think we're at like 191 today. We're a little positive. Yeah, I mean, rates are up. There. There's a seasonal. Remember, a lot of the, what's driving spot rates yeah. right now is, you have certain items which have a very short shelf life. They have to be into, Christmas trees is a great example. Wrapping paper is a great example. If you don't have Christmas trees to the Christmas tree lots by December 20th, then you, then you're there's no point in even doing it. I don't know anybody that shops for Christmas trees. On December paper. 20th? That would be like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the bad dad. I, I, I have the fake Christmas trees, so I don't, yeah. I've don't. i never had a real Christmas tree. You're I'm one, soul, of, Craig. I'm one of those guys. I will convert you. I should have brought my tablet. Dude, I have, like, I have bad allergies. My, yeah. my, my, my mother-in-law always has a real Christmas tree. I talked them into the fake ones. Ooh. Well, so. hey, let's go through one more thing, though. So, so Biden, you know, Biden's been on TV and he's been like, I need the stations to drop the pump prices. You said something interesting to me the other day. You said, you know, in some ways he's kind of right. And we have a couple of charts here that's going to show you the spread. Let's start with this one. What are we looking at? Yeah, so this is the wholesale price of diesel, the ULSD, the ultra low sulfur uh, uh a uh, rack price, which is wholesale. So that is assessed based on the New York Mercantile Exchange, which the CME owns, is futures market in New York. And they basically daily trade the price of diesel, ultra low. And that is basically the truck stops uh, or the racks, the think about them as refiners and that whole ecosystem, will set the price of diesel based on the futures contract um, that's traded every day. So that price is going to fluctuate. So that's the green line, and the white line above it is the retail price. This is the pump price that our community of truck drivers are paying. Now, if you are a large trucking company, yeah, uh, then you're buying your fuel on wholesale prices. And what that means is your fuel prices, your fuel index is based on the rack price plus or minus with a discount. So you may negotiate with a truck stop, I'm rack I'm, I'm rack price or I'm rack minus five or I'm rack plus 10. Yeah. And what that means is that the price of fuel that you're getting is a discount or premium above that right price and it's settled every day and it's painted every day. The retail price is what you see at the pump. So when you and I come up in our- LTL uh, company. Well, Boston. in our Peterbilt yeah. or our Mac Anthem and we drive up to the pump because we have one, we have now two trucks. So it sounds like we've expanded. For sure. So, we, so when we go to the pump and we fuel up, we are gonna buy on the retail price. Okay. So we're paying right now, on average, uh, the spread is $2.08 a gallon, which is a record high. Now, one thing is you have to note in that number is that does not include the transportation cost okay. from the refinery to the to the rack to the to the truck stop. So that's a, a, a cup, you know, that that is a portion of that. And it does not include the local taxes. So typically the way to think of this is take about 50 cents a gallon off that number, that national number, and you can get to the actual derived number. And you can do it by state. This is what IFTA is responsible for and what the fuel cards will do. But you think about that. The gal the price of what we're paying for fuel is if you take that that two oh seven and then take out the taxes and, and transportation delta, about a dollar fifty seven more than a truck that shows up from a fleet that's got a thousand trucks. And that's so brutal. you think about that. That means again, who's exposed to the spot market? Yeah, it's the small trucking companies. Who's exposed to the, being the last guy in the routing guide? It's the small trucking companies may not even be in the routing guide. They may be taking freight from the load boards, which don't have a lot of freight. And who's exposed to the uh, price of high diesel? It's the small guys. This is exactly the same thing we talked about the labor movement, where people feel like the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. It, it means that that delta is happening right now in the trucking industry, where the small companies are struggling far greater than the big companies. And we saw this through the earnings reports. You go back and look at the big public trucking companies. For the most part, they were bullish. Even when we were bearish, yeah. they were still bullish up until uh, well into the third quarter. Because they're banking that in FSC, right? So they benefit from that. In their, so you what so they report it different ways. Sometimes they report it in net fuel cost. Uh, sometimes they report it. So it depends on how they actually disclose their their line items. But effectively, it's about a 25 cent gallon. If you go back to the lowest point in October, the delta on, on 20, 25 cents a mile 
uh, increase in contribution margin to their P&L um, on those loaded miles where they get a fuel surcharge compared to what they were in October. Now, keep in mind what they also aren't, if they take freight from the spot market, then um, they're not getting a fuel surcharge. But when they have fuel surcharge, they're making on average, just from the price of fuel, about 25 cents a mile more than they did in early October. Wow. So it's a, it's a big thing. And what's interesting about it is you can actually look at earnings reports if you play the stock market. You can actually look at the price, that delta because none of the big trucking companies talk about it. But you can actually see where they can end up beating the numbers versus the analyst because that fuel price, that wholesale fuel price shows up in the numbers. Um, and it's just the way that, 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 that they account for it. Wow. But great. Thank you so much. For Sorry to be like confused. <laughs> no, it's all uh, good. It, you got Bill. Uh, is that Brooks in there? Too? It is Brooks. That's Bill and Brooks. They have, they have, uh, do you want to hear about this thing that they're, that they're bringing out? Well, I saw the release yeah, and I know that they teased it. I mean, this is like enemies of the, like enemies of the enemies, right? Like, uh, that's coming the together. Whole, let's bring them up. Isn't the whole point that you guys are starting to collaborate right now? We got Brooks McMahon from Convoy. We got Bill Drieger from Uber Freight here with us. We're all holding hands here. This yeah. is a kumbaya moment. Very holiday. You guys gonna bring them well, up? Well, I can't hear them. Well. By the way, dinner. Oh yeah, you can't. So oh, sorry, I will let you guys. I will you let guys. you guys get the conversation. Everybody, have a great holiday, uh, and dinner. Yeah. Great year this year. You too. And uh, we'll we'll see you soon. We'll catch you soon. Take care. Thanks for stopping by. Hey, got a little fuel education. You guys uh, enjoy that? I can't hear Bill now. Guys, can you bring Bill back up on me? Here we go. I got Bill now. Bill. So we got Bill Drigger here from Uber Freight. We got Briggs McMahon from Convoy. They have just announced. Well, I'll let you guys announce it. What did you just announce? Yeah, we're super excited to announce that the Convoy, JB Hunt, and Uber just formed what we're calling the SSC, or Scheduling Standards Consortium, which is getting industry leaders like our companies and hopefully a number of others to build a standard for full truckload freight deployment scheduling. What, is is it ready? Is like the standard ready to share? When can we publicly do this? As, as Craig mentioned, we're talking about cats and dogs working together here. <laughs> yeah, so we, we just announced it this week. We're, our goal is to have it published in Q1. Uh, but from between now and Q1, our plan is to bring more uh, parties into this standard and to get, get towards a, a publishable standard. Don't you guys know this is freight? Why are you working together instead of doing this individually? <laughs> we, well, we've each been, all of us and many of our competitors have been working on this problem for a long time. Anyone who's been in freight knows that one of the more costlier parts of it is the scheduling that, that goes on, the rescheduling and all the different systems and bespoke processes. And so we decided that we're, we're going to be better together. Uh, we're be better working together than each of us continuing to invest lots of of time and money in solving a problem on our own. So, Bill, what is the expected impact of this API standard on freight? This is a brave new world for some of us. Yeah, so it's a point of friction where if we don't have standards, you're creating a lot of extra work for all parties. Uh, the analogy I, I, I use is it's kind of like defining the USB-C standard, right? So once you have this standard, all the different systems know how to plug in together in a very seamless way versus having different standards across all the systems. Everybody's got to build their own interfaces. Uh, and then it just makes harder to drive other capabilities and other automations across the system. So this is step one, but then you know, down the down the road, then you get all the efficiencies, all the new use cases, all the benefits of having just a standard way of talking. So how did this collaboration originate? Do we put your boots too close together at F3 or something like that? <laughs> Actually, yeah, there, there was an F3 component. So some of these conversations did happen at, at F3, but uh, ultimately, you know, executives across the company, this is a, it's a conversation point that we've been having for a long time across companies. And uh, it was clear there was an opportunity to collaborate and come up with a uh, a better standard. And again, it's a point of friction that everybody suffers from. And it's not a place where we're all looking to compete. It's a place where we're all kind of, we would all benefit from more collaboration. Yeah, like the industry can't scale at a certain point, you realize you're your own bottleneck, right? I mean, this is a fragmented industry, one company can only do so much. And it's because we, you know, like we just heard like trade lens go away the merch thing. And that was a collaborative platform. And it didn't really work out. But I think freight absolutely needs this. And if you've been on the booking side, you understand the problem. But how do you get involved with it? Is this a stage that you, you know, you're piloting? Can people join in? Yeah, I think like Bill said, you know, this is 
it's critical that the whole industry or large parts of it participate for this to actually work. So between, as Bill said, between now and the end of the year, we're having lots of conversations with various transportation intermediaries, otherwise known as brokers, um, TMS partners, WMSs, and hopefully identify who really wants to participate and at what levels, and we'll hopefully get started in earnest in, in Q1. But, um, but yeah, we have a website, freightapis.org, where they can go on and sign up. We've already had lots of great conversations. The interest seems high, so we're really encouraged and looking forward to getting started. And just so we're clear, what is sort of is the elevator pitch on this standard? What, what exactly will that mean to everybody? Sure. So uh, for, for shippers, I would say that uh, ultimately they will get more efficiency at the dock door. They'll get uh, more partners that can integrate and automate those scheduling appointments going forward. So shippers will see you know, lower costs, more flexibility, more resiliency in their supply chain as an ultimate output of this. For the TMS providers and the carriers and the brokers, it's really about near term just Aligning on an easier way of doing business, it means less dev hours spent on integrations. It means uh, less friction. It means that they will be able to engage and interface with more systems across the ecosystem. And again, this is step one. There's still a lot of work because after this, it's, it's all about adoption and integration and actually implementing these standards across all the systems. But as we go down that path, everybody will see just benefits and easier communication. Scheduling, I always say, is it's, a, it's the final frontier of automation. It's the probably most fragmented uh, step of the load life cycle in terms of systems and processes and standards. And so if we can all come together and simplify that, again, everybody wins. And, and Brooks, I guess before I let you go, my last question is, is, is there a use case? What would be like a really good example of a use case someone would be using this in, especially like as an early adopter? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the, the main use case, you know, as, as Bill sort of described, is you've got a bunch of folks that are, currently going into various TMSs or they've scraped TMSs or they're making phone calls or sending emails to try and get that optimal appointment. And in the future, ideally, they'll have, <clears throat> they'll have this standard built into their own system. So they're working in their normal workflow and they're able to schedule the appointment and save themselves and the other side of the coin uh, a lot of time. And I think that's really important for the industry. And hopefully all those, those costs will get ultimately passed on to to the different parties or those different uh, savings rather. Well, that is excellent. If people want to learn more, where do I send them to? FreightAPIs.org. Freight API. And if my kids, after they get that digital drum set, Bill, if they need to learn more, I'll, uh, I'll hit you up for some virtual lessons, my man. <laughs> yeah, I do have more advice. So any, anytime. Oh, and, okay. and one other point before we break, I, I got to get, we got to get an Uber Freight uh, ornament on that tree too. Yeah, where is it? And we need a holiday message from you guys too. I'm looking for funny. I'm looking for offices. I want people. It doesn't have to be overly corporate. You know, this is, this is what the truck. Yep. Appreciate you guys. Have a, have a Merry Christmas. I'll be on the lookout for that ornament. Happy holidays. And I'll catch you in the new year. Thank you. Happy holidays. Like those guys. All right, we're going to tip the band. I know things got a little uh, chaotic in the open, so I missed it. Sorry about that, AIT. I'll jump right for you here. Did you know AIT publishes a global transportation market report every month? So if your business needs information about air and ocean trends, carrier updates, economic forecasts, North American trucking, and customs clearance news, you can get all of that and more in an easy-to-digest overview. Best of all, it's free to download, right? Look at this economy. Who wants to be paying for these reports? right people aren't even getting lululemon pants talk to you about that later uh the december edition is now available at aitworldwide.com go check them out for all of your needs meanwhile Everyone here with cats, you put up your Christmas tree. I know that you are highly afraid that they will jump and attack them. Our own super trucker, he had his fake tree. Apparently, he's on team Mr. Freight Waves with their fake trees. Shame, shame, shame. Well, his, his cat managed to make it up in his tree, but that one's pretty high up. You think these two cats will be able to do it? White one looks like he's uh, found a spot. He's judging it. Oh! But he made it. He made it. He was right dead center in the middle. God bless cats. Don't ever mess with them. Let's see who we got up next. We can talk about transportation going green. What do you guys think about that? Larry Cox, Vice President of Sustainability at PGT Trucking. What is going on? We're going to talk about how they're pioneering sustainable initiatives within the trucking industry. Larry, how you doing? Not bad. What's Afternoon. up? Where are, you, where are you sitting? What part of the world are you at? Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh Airport. 
Interesting. Interesting. Tough season for the Steelers a little bit, but you know, love the city. Love the city. <laughs> You've been you've been in sustainability, I believe, now for at least a decade, correct? If not longer, 15 years, 20? Uh, myself or the company? Yourself, you, you, you the man. Uh, actually, no, I'm, an, um, I'm what we affectionately call around here an old mill honky. So I spent 25 years in the steel business. I've been in trucking for the past 18. Interesting. So you know trucking really well. So you would know that trucking, um, that going green is not just about getting a better truck. There's a lot to go into that. PGT's future of flatbed is something is a company-wide movement. But what is it if people don't know? Well, we're looking at all aspects of the business. Um, you know, there's, there's a thing going on out in industry in terms of people have to be more efficient. They have to be more green. We have to reduce the carbon. Um, you know, we're a trucking company. We don't make trucks. We don't manufacture or distill fuel. And so we have to work through uh, the technologies that are currently available, the technologies that we see um, coming down the pike and figure out what can we do to help further things along. So the future flatbed really covers uh, a number of aspects. So for example, um, this year we're bringing in roughly 200 brand new trucks. Uh, they're getting spectacular fuel economy, very nice. But we looked within that buy and we found certain parameters on certain trucks got us even better fuel economy. And we've revised our order spec on the trucks that haven't come yet because we want to milk every, every MPG out of those trucks. Uh, one, because it saves us money. And two, for the better fuel economy, you have less carbon emissions. That's something we can do today. Um, well, yeah, was, we're working. reducing carbon emissions, this is, this is a topic that I always get into because I've, I've used freight optimizers before, and you can see how many empty miles are running, and they're like the empty calories of freight. They're what make you fat, and they contribute to all this stuff. That's some of the stuff you're mentioning, right? You, can, you don't have to go out and buy a Tesla Semi or something. You can start looking at the excess miles that you're putting out there. Yes, if you can keep trucks running, coming and going, and not uh, going out and coming back empty, that is green any number of ways. One... I'd rather have somebody pay me to come back with a load than to come back empty. And at the same time, I'm not wasting emissions uh, hauling nothing. So that, that's a big piece of it. So we have a lot of aspects we're looking at. Um, you may have read that uh, part of our future flatbed initiative is we're working with uh, Nikola Motors. We have a letter of intent to acquire 100 of their um, fuel cell vehicles when they come available. It's gonna be sometime next year, we'll see the first trucks come on board. Uh, those are going to be nice trucks. They're hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Uh, the only emission from those vehicles is going to be uh, uh, water vapor, and uh, we're looking forward to it. But that's sometime next year. Uh, what can we do today? Um, you know, I've talked with our people internally, and I said, you know, sometimes it's little things. I have a little project going on right now. Uh, our goal is to reduce the electrical power consumption in our headquarters by 50%. We're going to replace the old fluorescent tubes with LEDs. We're putting in motion detectors to shut off the lights when people leave at the end of the day. Um, it's small. It's not going to save the world, but it's going to reduce carbon emissions. It's going to save us a couple of bucks, and it's the right thing to do. So we're trying to see where we can take initiatives and go forward to uh, save money and save emissions and sort of further the art. Larry, in your experience, how have you how have you pushed forward green issues when there's been um, skepticism or maybe even resistance? You know that happens sometimes in trucking, and I think a lot of companies face that on their journey, or you know yeah. sometimes they're just not even sure which direction to go, which manufacturer to go with. How do you push through those just sort of initial fear barriers? Uh, well, well, first off, we have great leader Greg Troy, and he's our president. And uh, you know, if you had to uh, blame the future flatbed on one person, I mean that positively, it would be Greg. He had the vision. Uh, a big characteristic of our industry, you know, in the flatbed industry, I think the typical carrier has less than 25 trucks. They don't have the resources to do some of the things that we're doing with future flatbed. You know, a guy running 10 or 15 trucks isn't going to do a partnership with a manufacturer. They don't have the time for that. Uh, we're running a thousand trucks, so the manufacturers will listen to us. So what we do, uh, you know, we started out wondering what's going on out there, what's going to happen. And uh, we can either sit back and wait for whatever it is to happen, which usually means it's gonna happen to us, 
uh, or we could get on board early and try to uh, influence the situation, provide input to the uh, manufacturers, and uh, get a jump start on this. Um, you know, when you talk about green, we have a lot of customers that talk about we want to be green, we want to reduce carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera, and we regularly have conversations with them. Um, that, you make a great point there. That, that Larry, you make a great point. That is one thing that um, has to be communicated a lot of times to some trucking companies these days that if they don't want to adopt these initiatives, there's a lot of pressure from the shipper community to do it, and that's only going to increase. So there's two barriers also working against carriers right now that don't want to make that transition, right? You've got the shipper pull, but then you've also got a regulatory pull that's coming in some of those aggressive timelines in places like California. Now, if there's people out there like they're panicked, they haven't done anything, right? It's 2023. Is, is it too late to get ready? No, it's not too, it's not too late. Um, now I'll give you an example. You know, we talked with all of our customers. I've had my job vice president of sustainability since June. Uh, we've talked with our customers and we have lots of customers that are putting promotions out and, and talking about decarbonization, et cetera. Fewer are the customers that are actually biting on and saying, hey, PGT, could you set me up with an all electric truck? I want to do something here. I need to show my customers what I'm doing. Uh, so we're starting to have a few of our larger customers come to us and say, I want a piece of that action. I see what you're doing. Uh, let's try it out. Uh, we had a conversation with one of our customers not too long ago where this was discussed as a joint R&D type project. Um, if we put a battery electric truck in service for a particular customer, we don't know exactly how it's going to work, and neither do they, but we both know that until somebody tries it, and works the bugs out of it, you aren't gonna know. So that's that's the approach that we're taking. I'd like to tell you that we have a plan that takes you absolutely from point A to point B to point C to point D, uh, but the technology is not gonna work that way. Uh, but somebody has to do the hard work, and we have to figure it out, and that's what we're doing. Larry, how did you, I, I have, I'm, this is a curiosity because I, I, I spent all year talking to people about uh, fuel cells and alternative fuels and battery electric trucks and the pros and cons. How did you make your decision to go with fuel cell, for example, with like the Nikola? Well, we're, uh, we're a uh, heavy haul flatbed carrier. So we're normally hauling, you know, 45, 50,000 pound steel coils around. Um, the battery electric trucks, and it's their nature. So this is not a complaint about them. The battery electric trucks tend to weigh a lot, some weigh as much as 30,000 pounds just for the tractor. And uh, when all is said and done, you're left with maybe 40,000 pounds of cargo carrying capability. Uh, if you're a steel hauler, that doesn't work. Um, furthermore, our if you have a load that, if you have a, a driver who needs to run the network, which means to be running all over the country, the range of the current battery electric trucks and the lack of charging infrastructure on top of that doesn't work. The hydrogen fuel cell truck, um, the ones that we're looking at, the initial versions will have a range of 500 miles. Uh, the trucks still weigh way more than we would like them to, but it is what it is. Um, so you will have a, a bit of a cargo hauling penalty with them. But our view is that the hydrogen fuel cell truck is um, more amenable to our longer haul, heavier haul, high, high GVW, high weight cargo application. Uh, so bottom line, if you're gonna haul a 50,000 pound steel coil with today's technology, that's not going to happen with a battery electric truck. Yeah, well, you know, you're trying to do, and you make a great point there, you know, some people are just trying to solve port runs or drive van runs, you are having some of the highest demands and highest needs pulling flatbed. So starting from from your perspective, you have a big hill to climb. And it's really cool to hear how far you've gotten so far. What what got, what has you excited about all of this as we move into 2023? I'm uh, just basically being the first ones out there and uh, seeing how it works. Um, by the way, my comments on the electric trucks are not to take a shot at them. They actually oh, no. have a great, they have a great application and drayage applications, uh, local applications where maybe you do 100, 120 miles in a day and you come back home, plug it in, put it to bed at night, start all over again the next day. Uh, so there's certainly a place for those, uh, but battery electric will not cover the uh, longer regional and long haul freight. It's just, it is what it is. Uh, but our excitement is one, you know, being first, being up front, being the leaders, 
uh, that means something. You know, uh, going to a customer and being the one who started it is a lot more fun <laughs> than the one who the customer comes to and says, hey, carriers A, B, and C did it. When are you going to get on board? So, yeah. um, well, it feels a lot more holistic more. that way too, right? Or a lot more genuine when you're like, this is something we already offer versus like, it's just, you know, carriers says, oh, we need you to check this box for our ESG score or anything like that. You've really yeah. got to get into that mindset, as you mentioned at the beginning of all of this. Yeah, so some of what we're doing is, is not glamorous. So I'll give you an example of just today. With today's truck technology, uh, if the weather's really cold, you need to plug your truck in to keep the, uh, the engine block warm. You got a block heater. But if you leave that truck sit over the weekend or sit over the course of a week, you may find out that you have a truck with a nice warm engine and it won't start because the battery's died. Mm. Um, and so there are various technologies to automatically start the truck over the weekend to occasionally charge up the batteries. Uh, I found myself this morning saying, well, that's kind of silly. I've got a truck that's plugged in, yet I still have to start it up and burn diesel fuel to take care of the batteries. So I've had conversations with representatives of two of our major manufacturers of supplies with trucks and said, you know, how can we work together and set up our trucks to when I plug them in, I keep the engine nice and warm, but then I also throw a little bit of juice to the batteries. So I don't have to run the engine to charge the batteries for a truck that's already plugged in. Not very glamorous, uh, but again, it's one of those little things, and sure. um, somebody, needs, somebody needs to start it. That's a, that's a, a personal peeve of mine, so I'll be happy if we get that one solved. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we still have to figure out a lot with charging, and, and I can understand why battery electric trucks are still sort of in drayage pilot programs. It makes a lot of sense. That's not yeah. slighted, of course. Technology has to build, and we're seeing momentum in that space. People who want to get in touch with you, though, they want to get in touch with uh, with your company over here, and they are with PGT Trucking, and uh, they want to get sustainable in flatbedding. Where do I send them to? Send them to me. Send them to you. <laughs> Go talk to Larry Cox. Yeah. Larry Cox, Cox at pgttrucking.com. Well, Larry, I don't know if we have an ornament of yours on the tree, do we? Maybe we do. I'm not sure if we don't. You got until next week to send one. We'll throw it right up on here on the Freight Holiday Tree. Appreciate your time today. Okay. Okay, take, great. Take care. Happy holidays. Okay. Hey, by the way, we got a new addition to the set right over here. It's that number one supply chain sign from University of Arkansas. Awesome guys over there. David Dabrowski. We got Fug uh, Fugit over there, Ryan Fugit. We got Daniel Stanton, Matt Walla, School of Business. Really cool stuff. All right, XBO. Shout out to another sponsor. XBO is driven to put your freight first. With coverage in 99% of U.S. zip codes, as well as key routes to Mexico and Canada, XBO will help you get your shipments where they need to go, on time and damage-free, all fine-tuned by 35 years of world-class LTL experience. Learn more at ltlsolutions.xbo.com. It's Friday. Good news, bad news. <laughs> Hope they're okay. All right, we got a little bad news for you. There's an earthquake, right? No, no, nobody wants to have a shaker. I think there was just one up in uh, Canada, and it was funny. And all the guys up in Alberta, the truckers I know up there, like half of them, like, like oh, I got knocked out of my sleep, and the other one's like, oh, my Christmas tree didn't even lose an ornament. But let's say you're in a really bad shaker. You've got this bed. That's the good news. Would you sleep in this thing? Check this thing out. Let's roll this video right here. So apparently you're in like the sarcophagus or this Iron Maiden. Your bed's in it, and then if S hits the fan, uh, Putin nukes us, or an earthquake happens, apparently this uh, trunk right here locks you inside and somehow I, I i don't know how long you're expected to live inside this thing because there's a bunch of bottles of water there's some mres in there i don't know if like once you go down does the bed flip does it flip you over how are you supposed to access this emergency kit or is the idea that you get locked in with the emergency kit and then like you break yourself out of the rubble but there's no emergency services anywhere and you're going to need all those bottles of water i'm trying to figure this thing out hey production team any of you guys preppers we got a prepper in the back. Yeah, you're just trapped in there. I don't know. Can you free yourself? There's a medical kit too. I think we get the point on that one. Uh, here's some bad news. Look at this. There's two trucks blocking the road. And look at what this idiot does right here. 
And I know we've all been here and you all get frustrated and you've probably all thought like, ugh, I wish I could just get around these two guys. Well, this trucker made the worst decision he could possibly do. He put at least three lives at risk, his own, and at least if there could be T-drivers, it could be even more. Two other trucks, look how boneheaded this move is. And not only is was it stupid that he did this move, but he also posted this video on social media. Like, that's a double whammy of dumb. Don't do that out there, drivers. You're not gonna get respect. At least not on what the truck. Bad news, demand has collapsed and even Lululemon can't sell their yoga pants. Take a look at this. Get those Lululemon yoga pants, people. There we go. Lululemon reported 1.7 billion in unused merchandise this third quarter. That is an 85% increase from last year. But here is the good news. The one you showed before. Yeah, there you go. It's right there. It's easier to find truck parking. My buddy, Barry Wimberly, he writes over here. What does he got for me? He says, I was at the Iowa 80. It was half full. He says he pulled in a lot like last night. It was a little bit ominous. ominous. You can see the car carriers pulled sideways. Um, one last one over here. Christmas lights on a truck. Let's take a look at this right here. You think this is tacky? You think this is good? You think it's dangerous? Rooster thinks that uh, the DOT is going to be licking their lips, looking to see if they can find a light bulb out on that one. I think it doesn't look bad, but I mean, look at my set right here. It's not like I don't get into the holidays, but uh, I asked the freight community, Nathan Strang over at Flexport. He said, love it. I give it a 10 out of 10. Keep, keep playing that. Let's look at some trucks a little bit. Uh, Michael Honey says, proper color of amber to the front and rear. So I think he's just criticizing a little bit about the layout um goose doesn't he says that truck is just awful it's got scratch paint hallie fazio she says she loves it um justin martin says ah too much hassle seems like more stuff to clean the winter now again he is a quiet quitter on christmas he is one of those people with a fake tree so take his opinion only as far as it goes charlotte says uh, i see my brother doing this i guess her brother's really into tacky christmas lights like me um 10 aircraft incorporated says looks fine for me paul mode and foul budget containers uk we are 100 percent in favor i like it guys um tricky mix says go big or go home these trucks look incredible uh not that truck he says these kind of trucks show this highly on one right here let's see like a little bit more of a professional design and he's referring to that so he says if you want to put lights on there you gotta it's all about the presentation you gotta make them look good Derek bezel says fair i didn't do it this year but i usually put lights on my tacoma it's christmas let's enjoy it and robert lewis he is a heavy haul transportation driver he says this is 100 percent foul oh look who i see in the bullpen right now too we got someone coming up in the green room we have one last surprise guest it's tom griffin he's the president at t-force worldwide and before we send you home for the weekend let's recap the year it's almost the end almost are we safe yet tom is the year done well it's 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 leveled off obviously uh we've seen business uh levels we do ltl truckload um ocean air uh on our freight forwarding side so we've seen you know things uh you know capacity i think is uh not as desperate anymore and uh right now we're just yeah trying to finish out the year strong it started out very strong but we've probably seen about a, a 10 12 percent decline over the last 90 days out there so less service issues um not so, not uh, a lowering of the billing issues that we've experienced this year in the ltl industry but uh yeah i mean it's uh there's been worse years i remember 2007 you know 2008 um, hey, is now a good know, time? It, Let me ask you something, because Craig Fuller suggested to me earlier yeah. we should start a uh, two-man LTL trucking company. Is now a good time to start an LTL company? How's that market doing? Do you think it'll be good in 23? Um, I think so. I mean, it's, you know, probably about 65% of what we do. Um, when we started out 16 years ago, that's all we did. Just uh, we grew, you know, rapidly, you know, in that time period. And it's just... Uh, it's problematic with regard to just, you know, the inspections that are going on. Um, we're looking at probably one out of four shipments um, is changed in terms of class, you know, weight by the carriers, which which is, you know, grown every year. We, we continue to see that trend, you know, probably increasing. 
And some of it, you know, really is due to, you know, shippers just taking a guess or, a, you know, a fly on a, a few things. But, um, <laughs> That, that, look, that, that inventory thing, Tom, that inventory thing, it, it swept through out the latter half of second year. Everybody was trying to stock up that inventory for the holidays, but it really bit a lot of shippers in the butt this year. We saw Lululemon was sitting on, eight, they sold 85, they're sitting on 85% more inventory than they were a year ago. We've seen the Target struggles. We've heard, we've heard the Walmart one. So shippers have been very confused by this rapid change in the market or this year-long change. How have they reacted to you? Because they're the ones going to their th- 3PL partners, what are you hearing from there? Um, same thing. I mean, in, you know, we do retail, but um, thankfully we're not, you know, we're really in a more business to business manufacturing. Um, we do business with, you know, large bakeries like Bimbo and manage their inbound supply chain. Um, but yeah, I think the striking thing that you know uh i was uh informed you know uh, the largest ltl provider you know out there uh who we have as our primary they're down almost thirty thousand shipments per day right now and uh so things there there is a uh softness in the marketplace that's uh, impacting a lot of people but i think that people are cautious um there's a lot of industries that haven't slowed down What we've seen, you know, the biggest uptick we've seen probably in in the second half of this year is expediting. So people are are letting inventory levels, you know, shrink, but it's causing them to, you know, have to expedite. And our daily, you know, next flight outs, you know, air freight shipments domestically are double what they were a year ago. Um, Exclusive use carriage, you know, is probably triple. Um, and that involves partials and whatnot. So I think some people are getting caught, you know, with trying to manage, you know, that, you know, stocking, you know, the, the way they're doing. And it's, you know, we're seeing it for manufacturers, just not the, the retail segment. It seems like the retail segment is probably in worse shape, you know, in terms of having, you know, an overabundance of inventories and whatnot. But manufacturing is really doing you know, a lot more expediting right now than we've ever seen. Before we move on to uh, 2023, when you, in sum up 2022, though, what's good, what do you think your biggest takeaway from the year will be? And what do you think has been the most impactful on uh, either your company or your clients? I would say um, billing uh, yeah. has been, in terms of the problematic thing with us, um, not just our largest provider out there, but covid forced a lot of companies, national carriers in particular, not so much the regionals like, you know, Dayton or Southeastern, but people are, you know, working from the house and they're they're not working in their billing teams as they did. So we are seeing a a dramatic increase in errors and it's forcing us to have um, either bi-monthly or weekly meetings with, you know, our, our service partners in particular, you know, on the LTL side of it. Um, and and it's just, it's not getting better. You know, we've got some carriers that have come out with, you know, from, you know, coming out at, you know, 21 with the increase in, in shipments and volumes, uh, new rules like, uh, capacity rules or truck order not used. And they're just wrong. And it's, it's caused us to have to staff up. I've probably got a, a team of nearly 30 people that just work with the carriers and their billing errors uh, on a regular basis. And that's kind of, as a 3PL, that's what we're driving, you know, some value from that in terms of being able to work with those corporate offices. But I haven't seen a drastic change like that until this year. So on the negative side, you know, that was it. Um, On the positive side, um, we've really um, gotten nimble. You know, in terms of, you know, the way we're operating, getting closer to customers and finding out what they're needing. And, you know, in, in, in a lot of cases, some of our customers have gotten angry at, you know, some of the carriers. And we've been able to switch that around. I mean, my favorite carrier is, you know, tr- truck's driving right here. And uh, I don't know if you can see that or not. I but, can't uh, move it over a little bit more, just a little bit in front of your, uh, a little close to your face. Which truck is that one? Is that a first gear uh, truck? That, that would be, that would be the FedEx one. 
Yeah. Uh, you, you, so so you, I used to work for FedEx. That is my, uh, my I got my first start in freight. Okay. And I also think that they have the best logo in the game. Just that arrow that the E and the X make. It's oh, like, yeah, yeah. so on point. I, I was I, I was with Custom Critical for about four years way back in the day. And uh, ba basically, we our TMS is set up for speed. So if you're going from Chicago, Illinois to Southern California, you know, there's a carrier that does that in three days, just like XPO would do that, you know, in three days. Um, so our customers will see the fastest transit, you know, time in there. So they're generally, it's the most recognized, you know, brand in the industry. They, it might be a few more dollars than the next guy, but they would actually have to page down to find the cheaper option, you know, that might be doing that in four or five days with us. So, by design, you know, we're looking for customers to select the better service carriers, even though we're offering just about every carrier within the TMS. So, you know, you brought up a really you the, the previous point was really good one. So I have a I have a buddy named Steve Ferreira and he he covers ocean and he is always yelling about, especially during the shipping crisis, audit your invoices. There's so much volume. There's going to be a ton wrong on them. Yep. Errors go way up the more volume there is. And that is great advice to any shipper. Anybody who's getting billed in freight, check out your invoice, especially just go back over like the past year, make sure everything pans out. I'm sure you probably didn't get paid or maybe you paid too much for some of these things. Now, there are the you mentioned was service right so one good thing about demand slowing down a little bit is it's easier to pick a carrier it's easier to pick a good partner to work with you don't have to take some cut rate thing because it's the only truck on the road right now how important is that service you were just starting to get into that it, it really is i mean every we have about ten thousand, you know active customers that ship you know at least weekly with us and they have the option to you know find somebody that might you know, be a little longer out there, uh, you know, in terms of transit, but oftentimes, you know, those are the carriers that might have a higher claims uh, occurrence, you know, that, you know, can can really muck things up. And, um, you know, we're just adding to our, our, we have a claim department to negotiate and work with all these carriers, whether it's a truckload carrier, LTL carrier, ocean, whatever it is. Carriers out there, what I've seen in the last two years is they're just denying everything in terms of a claim. And I think that's one advantage with those shippers that are able to use a 3PL that has, you know, experienced people out there that we can, you know, make sure that we're not agreeing with that. You know, we've got pictures, whatever it is, um, you know, but in most cases, you know, from a billing standpoint, I thought I thought that was a, a good point that you brought up. We don't invoice and send anything to a customer until after delivery. We don't invoice the day of pickup anymore on LTL shipments because, like I said, it looks like in 2023, one out of three shipments will probably be reclassed, reweighed, and rebuilt you know, by a carrier. So what we're doing to try to extend value to our customers is give them only one invoice. Now, our parent company, TFI International, doesn't you know like that, but we're we've proven to them that we would actually had to add a lot of staff to do rebuildings because of what's going on in the LTL industry. So we've taken the approach where we're not going to invoice until we know we've got the final EDI transmission from the carrier and the weight class, you know, are typically the two drivers that change, you know, most freight bills. Um, are correct and in the system and our, our system doesn't allow anything outside of a, a small variance to, to invoice anyways. So anyways, we've got, you know, checks and balances in there that I think it's, it's the finance people with our customer base that, you know, we've endeared ourselves to because they're not going through the normal process. If they've got, you know, 10 shipments a day and all of a sudden they've got to redo and, and, cut another check for three or four of them on a daily basis, that's exhaustive. But it's what's happening out there. Tom, I got 25 seconds left. Lightning question. What mode will be the calmest and what mode will be the most chaotic in 23? Um, calmest, I think, because of the lower volumes is going to be the ocean. I, I think, you know, the t tide has turned on that. I think the most volatile is going to be LTL. From what we're seeing, just because, you know, the costs for the carriers are going up. And right now there's a race to the bottom on the price um, that 
was very similar to what I saw back in 2007, 2008. And uh, anyways. No, I hear that's, you. I don't. I don't disagree there, and that's why Craig and I are going to start that uh, two-man LTL company because I remember in 2019, Bradley <laughs> Jacobs said the thing about Frank that he loves is volatility because volatility creates opportunity. Change happens all Absolutely. the time in freight. Stay ahead of it. Contact T Forbes Worldwide. Talk to Tom Griffin and his team. Get your house in order in 2023. Tom, yep. you and the team have a very happy new year. Merry Christmas. Thank you, sir. T Forbes. Right. High tech right there. I love it. <laughs> We'll be back Monday. I got uh, Matt McLean, Matt McLean at Covenant. He was just on, what, a three-day uh, road trip in the cab. He'll be joining us. We got Tom Burnett, Kodiak Robotics, a whole bunch of stuff. I'm Mitchell Rattini, Dota Scott on the show. We're going to get podcast. Don't be a stranger. This is an LTL Freight Crosstalk facility. And we have locations like this all across North America. East Coast, West Coast, even our neighbors to the north and south. At XBO, our network helps us deliver 18 billion pounds of freight every year to 99% of US zip codes and beyond. And now, it's getting even bigger because we're adding 900 new doors to our terminals. XBO, your freight first. Can our so good truckloads of grass to Pittsburgh every month? Who do you know in Pittsburgh? Lots of cousins. Always complaining about the grass here. The grass is bad in Pittsburgh. Right? It's bitter, like a cruciferous vegetable. Well, with RxO, you can access over a million and a half trucks, any mode of transportation, even flatbeds. Just log in. There's a log right there. You know what cruciferous means, but not log in? I'm a complicated creature. Massive capacity, cutting edge technology. So, you need to reroute a large shipment from LA to Boston. With XPO, you can make it happen with one call to right here. An XPO team with local connections that will help find a solution. We've spent over 35 years perfecting LTL freight operations to make it easy for our customers to do business with us. Why? Because we're driven to be the best. XPO, your freight first. Welcome back to another edition of Check Call, Check Call, Check Call, Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know, <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? Oh, okay. Is pizza an open-faced sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen this 